Hey, welcome to Hot Takes. I'm your host, James Scott, here to analyze anything and everything interesting. Let's dig into today's topics. Welcome back to the number one MLB podcast on the internet. It's me, your friendly neighborhood editor, Chris, and I'm here with the man, with the plan, James himself. Let's go. Like every single <laughs> week, here we are talking about some baseball, and uh, we got a we got a different one for you today. We 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 definitely have a different one from you, uh, for you. Uh, I, I said from because from the mind of James, I like we were talking about this beforehand, and I was just like asking so many questions, and I forgot to hit record. And, <laughs> and we, were, I'm like, I'm like, well, there goes the podcast. Like, <laughs> we're having the podcast here off of the podcast. Uh, but before we get started with today's topic, and I don't want to introduce it too quickly, I know that James actually wanted to talk about Alex Bregman. Yeah, we got to get the cheaters out of the way because yeah. we're gonna have a fun one today. So, uh, yeah, uh, Bregman apparently coming back from. Uh, his hamstring uh, was taken out of the game the other day. I think it was yesterday. Uh, I think they might be like really having to really take it easy with him at this point Mm -hmm. because he's starting to have more discomfort in his hamstring. So um, it's looking like in, you know, what ends up happening with a player who's, who's this young and, and who's been this successful it's going to happen to the rest of them too, uh, likely in worse ways, especially for Correa because he's already had back issues. Um, is if you have a player who, you know, they go from cheating to not cheating. We've seen the ability to hit righties fell off a cliff. Mm-hmm. They had to change their entire approach to be successful. That success looked like a lot of success on mistakes, walks outside the zone. So tons of walks. And all of a sudden, all the balls that they're hitting are pulled. And, you know, not all of them are successful in play, but certainly they're hitting an elevated number uh, to the pull side out of play. So mistakes in the zone, basically. Uh, And then as pitchers got used to them with this approach, they struck out more. And then literally two months in, guys like Correa, Bregman, uh, their strikeouts went through the roof. The production fell off of a cliff. Um, and, you know, Bregman got hurt. He was probably trying to overextend himself to compensate for all of these things. Um, so he re-aggravated an injury that he had, you know, near spring training. I believe it was – it might have actually been a calf in injury initially. So maybe he was using different parts of his body to compensate mm-hmm. for, you know, a, a, a not 100% calf. And that's how this happened. Either way, lower body injury. And he's been known to have that as, as his injury issue in the past. But um, now it seems like in overextending himself, trying to get back to uh, the club and, and, and producing, he's getting hurt. And I wonder what will happen to guys like Correa next. Because Correa's back injury, I'll tell you, it's, it, it's come back in, in subsequent years. Uh, so it's an it's, it's a issue that he's had his whole career. Um, so now seeing that, you know, Bregman is – you know, re-aggravating it, re-aggravating it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, both of their production has gone exactly the same way. Um, it, you know, we, we talk all the time about what the Astros did by cheating and hurting other players. But in addition to that, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not something – you can weigh both of these concepts at the same time, you know. In addition to that, they destroyed themselves. Guys who are – in their 20s, heading into their prime, they destroyed themselves. I don't think they're going to be the same guys. I've said it over and over. Um, I think Altuve also will probably join them. It's been a little bit slower for him because he increased his foot speed this year. He's getting a lot of ground ball singles. Um, But, uh, yeah, I think similar things are going to happen to him as well. I think they already have started to happen. I think he's officially a... uh, a guy who works the count and walks. Um, and, and, and that's not who he's historically been. And um, like I said, once pitchers adjust to that, I think that uh, there's going to be quite a lot of swing in this. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be very much hard contact. Uh, I mean, we saw how bad things could get without. He was the worst guy on the team last year. 
So um, I think they're going to go right back to that. So cheaters going to cheat, get what they get. Um, Facts. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I wanted to bring up um, on our last live stream, we were talking about um, you know different players' profiles and which players would make the edges of the list. And mm -hmm. you know, we talked about Kike Hernandez, and I, I had to reassess Kike honestly after we had that podcast. I ended up actually determining he's worthy of being put on these lists um, because versatility cannot be undervalued. Um, and, you know, I already value it to a certain degree. I had to go back over players and see if there was anyone I was really missing, but you know, he was one of the only ones uh, that I was missing. I think there was like two others. Um, but it made me think about the other side of it, which are guys who don't have versatility, who aren't particularly good defensively, um, who – are kind of one dimensional players, you know? Um, I mean, it's one thing if they're, if they're a really great base runner and, and that's obviously something that you have to take into consideration. But if the profile is just a righty power hitter, um, how valuable does that hitter have to be in order to make up for the lack of versatility, the lack of, um, of defense you know um so it made me have to go back over players and like i had to acknowledge that guys were um perhaps successful in their value because of who they are now in terms of how much they can drive in for a team but not necessar necessarily successful because of who they're going to be long long term like outside of the next four years um, and not particularly successful because of the different ways they can be used. Um, so in looking at those types of players, those one-dimensional players, typically right-handed hitters, because lefties, you can reduce their role to a platoon role. Um, I had to look at a bunch of different guys and just be really honest and you know, not care about how much I liked the player and just you know, be like, okay, is this a guy – they don't have ver versatility on defense. They don't have base running ability at all. Uh, everything that they do is based off of how much of a power hitter they are because they're not exactly a guy who hits for batting average, sprays the ball around the field. No, they're, they're, they're a power hitter. They're, they're not, they have that swing. They have the power hitting swing. And then you have to really factor in something that we talk about all the time, which is approach. So if you have no versatility, you have no defense, you have no base running, you don't have, you know, an aggressive approach to go with your power. You're just working the count to get to mistake pitches as a righty. I have to really, really uh, ding those kinds of players. I have to really uh, be critical about those types of players. Um, so it made me think about a lot of guys differently that are on, you know, our, our, our top player list, which is, you know, that's another one that we're going to do a subsequent episode on. Like we're, we're, we're doing an episode very soon on, on it, where we're going to talk about that player list and how it's changed since the beginning of the year. Uh, but I'll give an example, like Pete Alonso. Uh, Pete Alonso is a fantastic hitter. He's one of the better power hitting righties in the game, Right. I like him. I like him a lot. You know, I saw him in the Arizona Fall League. That was one of the first time I, I ever saw him. I actually was like in the third row, something along those lines. Very close. And I remember just being like, wow, this guy's, this guy's a big human. And he, come, he, he came up and, and, and he hit like a double and I think a homer that day. But um, I looked at his profile and I was like, you know, this guy's definitely coming into his own. This guy's definitely a second half player. He's going to have a killer second half. But then, like, I, st I stepped back for a minute and I was like, okay, what positions does he play? Well, if he plays first base. And when the DH comes into the league, he's not going to play first base. He's going to be the DH. Um, so he, he, he doesn't really play defense that good. Um, 
So there's no versatility there. There's not above average amounts of defense there. He's not a good base runner. Righty hitter, which, you know, right now while he's in his prime, he's going to do tons of damage, especially having the barrel awareness that he does. He's going to hit for doubles and homers. Um, but you wonder when a bat like that does start to age, is he going to be able to hit righties as well? Um, and, you know, it's a risk as a righty hitter, righty on righty. Um, and with no other skills to really back up on defensively, versatility-wise, or on the bases, that's a massive amount of risk for a very short-term, risky amount of game. So I just started thinking about it like that. Like, he could command a lot in a trade if a big league club thought about him like this. And, you know, for, for a team that's very short-term, um, it can work. You know what I mean? Um, but you need to balance him out with the right people. I mean, here's the deal, okay? At the beginning and the end of the day, he's balanced out with the right people. He is on the right short-term team. He's a fantastic member of the Mets, and he's a superstar. And he's going to reflect that. He's in, he's in the perfect role for his skills. So I'm not even hating on the guy. He's going to do what he's got to do because he's, he's in the right position to do it. He's got the ability to do it. Um, but in isolation, in isolation, you know, you, you, you don't want to build an offense around just him. If you have all the contributing parts, he's perfect. But, you know, there is obviously significant risk with this profile uh, of it being able to do different things if the usual risk that happens with righties happens which is, you know, later career, having a harder time versus righties. Happens with any, happens with both righties and lefties, actually, now that I'm thinking about it. Later you get into your career, uh, the more uh, your handedness is going to be difficult on you, pitching to him. So, um, you know, it just kind of made me think about, you know, a couple of different players like that. Um, you know, I think we talked about this the other day as well. Uh, I don't know, it's actually more like the other week, the other month. Uh, we talked about Michael Conforto. I think we talked about how, you know, he's a, he's a patient batter. He, you know, is a, a good defender in a corner outfield position, which a lot of people are. He's a first half player, typically, um, which means in the second half, which you really is when you, that's when you do your playoff push. Uh, he's not quite as good as you need him to be. Uh, added benefit is he's a left-handed hitter. Uh, so you can, you know, in theory, put him in some sort of platoon if he starts to age. Um, and, you know, he'll still be able to contribute for longer into his career. And with the right team, he's perfect. I think he's perfect with the Mets. Him and Alonso actually complement each other very well, righty-lefty. But you also got to remember that Conforto is the kind of hitter who he'll walk, he'll strike out to a certain degree. And he pulls the ball. That's what his profile is. Um, but, you know, that's a profile that, as time goes on, leans straight into being a mistake hitter. Mistakes out of the zone walks. Mistakes in the zone pulled for power. And there's not necessarily a lot wrong with that. But it becomes very risky if you're not the fastest guy. And if you're a left-handed hitter in an era with the shift. Now, if the shift goes away, all of a sudden, Conforto gains a ton of value. And as he's entering his physical prime, it, it's worth considering that his mm -hmm. first halves of being very good could stretch longer and longer and longer into the year. And the fact that he's a lefty, you know, the, the amount that he could hit righties, you can really diverse, diversify your lineup with a guy like that. Um, in addition, he's starting to get really good at these diving catches. So his defense might not just be good at a corner outfield position. It might be a step better than that, bordering on great. But that's just a personal take. I think some of the things that he's starting to be able to do out in the corner outfield position are similar to Cole Calhoun, who I think is a great defensive corner outfielder. Um, so, it, you know, it's just interesting. You have to consider all of the different things into, you know, the equation when valuing these guys over multiple years 
or even how they're going to be used in the short term. Uh, fortunately, you know, I think we talked about this like literally in the last episode mm-hmm. um, that, you know, if you are, you know, that typical mistake hitting hitter, even if, you know, and, and you know, you're, you're, you're competent defensively, you know, you're competent on the bases becomes a big issue if you're a righty, but if you're a lefty that opens doors for you because just having that handedness advantage, we talked about handedness for a whole episode, just having that handedness advantage uh, makes it so you're hitting the majority of pitchers that your team is facing over the course of a year and you can get a full season of playing time as a lefty in a platoon. You got to remember that if you're anyone who's young doing analysis, if you have a lefty in a platoon, they get a full season of at-bats. Righties don't. Righties get like 225 at-bats, something along those lines in a platoon if they're healthy. So um, it's very important to remember that, that handedness really pays that much. Uh, it just, it pays, it pays. Handedness pays. Uh, if you can understand how it works, uh, it, it's huge. Tampa Bay understands how it works uh, to a T. Uh, and there's a couple of other clubs that are starting to figure it out enough to support what else they have going on. Like, I'll give an example, right? I'm not sure that the Yankees have an idea of how to maximize handedness. But what I do know is that they have enough talent from the right side that the lefties that they've added make it the right combination. It's the right combination of, of a lineup. Um but given that they added two guys who are pull hitters who, you know, are, are, are definitely going to be more successful on their ISO than their BABIP, you know, that's typically mistake pitches. And both guys who, you know, are, are known to walk, again, mistakes out of the zone. I, I don't know how much the Yankees are putting preference on a player's ability to um, – Hit pitchers' pitches. Hit difficult, you know, pitches where pitchers execute what they're trying to do and you still do damage. Um, But then again, also, how many lefties are there out there who have that skill? Um, And that's also worth really going into because I'm not just talking about lefties out there who have the ability to hit tough pitching. With what the Yankees are trying to do, they got to be able to hit it for power. Um, and personally, I think that's a very hard thing to ask for. But it looks like that that's, that's what Cashman wants. That's what the Yankees want. They want a full lineup of power hitters, lefties and righties. Um, and they don't really seem satisfied until they get that. Like, I'll tell you, if Cano had re-signed with the Yankees, he would have fit perfectly mm-hmm. because he was a lefty power hitter, doesn't strike out hits for average, even in a shift era. Um, I'll tell you, you know, if uh, Cano is our third baseman, I'm a Yankee fan to say, R, oh, yeah, stop that. Uh, if he was the Yankees' third baseman, I think he'd do a fine job. I, I've always said that I thought Cano would be a stud defender if he was at third because he's got such fantastic hands and such an amazing arm. Um, I think he'd do fantastic over there. I just wouldn't want to pay him. If that makes sense. So you can hit. He can defend. He's lefty. That's the kind of player that I think the Yankees would really like to have. Um, Rizzo's close. I'll tell you, getting Rizzo at the deadline got them a player that's really close to the, the kind of guy that they need, like a kind of Cano guy. But the difference is, is that Rizzo can't hit for batting average. Cano hits for like 35 points higher batting average typically than Rizzo. So, I mean, I'll take it. Look, I'll, I'll take what we can get with Rizzo. Take what we can get with Gallo. We already got Odor. Uh, that's three lefties right there. So, um, but yeah, so I've been going over a lot of guys, Chris. Mm-hmm. I've been going over a lot of different types of players. Um, like taking, you know, different looks at different guys. Um, just trying to be, you know, pretty honest with separating how much I like a player with how many different things that they can do. Like I was trying to look at, you know, one, another one of my favorite players, you know, Chris, you know, I love, I love the small skills. I love guys. I love guys who hit for batting average. I love guys who get on base. 
I love guys who can run the bases a little bit or, or, you know, more than that really. But, you know, I'm talking about a guy specifically here with these references. I like guys who play middle infield, you know, um, and I like guys who are weird, quirky personalities because I think in, in the dugout, you, you need to really just remember that, like, even though this is, the, you know, the stage, this is the biggest competition that you're going to get, right? At the beginning and the end of the day, if you have skills, it's a game and you can just go play it if you think about it like that. You know, I, again, for some guys, it's harder. Different people have different psych psychological makeups and they get psyched out by different things. Yeah. But if you can reduce it to, I'm hanging out with my buddies and we're tossing the ball around. And it, it becomes a little bit easier to get into that kind of zone. There's, people have a word for that kind of zone now. Uh, I, some sort of scientific term but you know back in the day we used to just call it the zone where everything slows down and you can concentrate and you feel like it's just you and the ball and you know it just hitting just comes naturally and not everybody can do that but uh the best hitters can and some of these guys they psych themselves out um some of these guys they, it, it becomes um everybody comes in and it's a job that's the last thing that you want to have. You don't want to have everybody coming in and it's a job. Because that really, that really sucks though. That really sucks if everyone's coming in and it's like, this is the job because you're supposed to, it's like you, you were saying just before it's you, you want to think of it as like you're with your buddies. Like yes. you're, you're playing this game with your buddies. And when you think of it as just a job, you know, I mean, I think the overall talk here is, about like production and like those those small little skills and stuff like that and everything so all that drops when you're coming in and you're like this is just a job like you're never going to perform at your yeah. at your best but to get back around to the guy i was about to mention sorry um, sorry no, no, i go i go off on my hey, tangents <laughs> no i'm i'm really glad because you're saying those small skills reminded me that like this is a guy i really i really need to you know pay attention to mm -hmm. You know, he, he's a quirky personality. He's got all these no, no Mark Garcia para mannerisms at the plate, adjusting his batting gloves and all that. Um, and he seems to be like a really fun guy. Like people say he's like fantastic in the clubhouse, right? Um, and he's batting above 300. And his on-base percentage is like 366. Um, he's not hitting particularly for a lot of power, right? And typically his type of profile... You know, they'll do really great for like a, a year or two while they're sustaining this ability of contact, you know. But after a certain point in time, pitching starts beating them uh, in terms of velocity, in terms of all of that type of stuff. Um, and then the contact becomes weaker. And then the batting average, because of that, drops. And you, you end up having a guy who you know, probably closer to a 285 hitter. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd say the on-base percentage will drop a little bit, but it'll still be good. But the power, the, 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 the slugging will, I don't think it's going to be very good, now, at least unless he has like a swing change or something along those lines. Um, but he's not very, like, I wouldn't say that this is a guy who I could put at shortstop. I mean, I, I could, I could, Play him there for a day um, or third even, you know, he's exclusively kind of a second baseman. And, you know, maybe there's worth, you know, an idea of trying him in left field. Um, but beyond that, um, you know, it's basically second in left field. And uh, I don't know if I'd say he's the greatest defensive second baseman in the game. So if you're looking for an above average defender, at second, which you should be moving forward with the shift going away, it's going to. Um, maybe you put him in left field and maybe that allows him to, you know, oh, okay, I'm in left field. This is less difficult for me. I'm going to concentrate on changing my swing um, so I can, you know, better handle the inside fastball. Um, but outside of that, there's a lot of risk to this profile. Um, and I can go through like a whole bunch of different guys like, because like, this is the thing, I really like Luis Arias. I really like him. Mm -hmm. I really like this guy. And, um, you know, Arias, he, 
with, with that, with, with the batting average and the on-base percentage being what they are, and his level of strikeout rate being as low as it is, his BABIP being as high as it is, right? I'd really want him to be able to figure it out. I don't know if the Twins are creative enough to move him to left field, but with Jorge Polanco, like on the team and, and not exactly the most competent shortstop on the planet. Uh, and he's hitting, by the way, Polanco's hitting. Uh, I, I don't understand why they don't put Polanco at second and Arias maybe in, in left. They'd have, they have to figure out a lot of um, what, what's going on with their outfield. Because Kepler's definitely going to get traded. Kirilov has had another wrist injury. Larnack, you moved very, very quickly through the minors. He's more of a corner outfielder. Um, Buxton's continuously hurt. He's not accepting an extension. You don't want to go into any sort of realm uh, uh, price range that he'll actually consider consider or, or any sort of realm of price range that is appropriate, in my opinion. Uh, and that's your center fielder. So you need to start being creative with your roster. Um, like I'll give another example. If Ryan Jeffers is the catcher of the future, A, you need to give him more time in AAA. I don't care if that means playing Ostadio every day because you're not going to contend this year. Just let Ostadio have big league at bats every day so you can see if there's something there as a hitter. I know it's going to be terrible defense at the big league level from him. It is what it is. You're not going to win, all right? And then next year, when Jeffers is ready, you plug him into catcher. You put Mitch Garver, for, you know, who was the catcher, he got hurt, put him at third. Donaldson was a catcher, okay? But Garver's already a good hitter, all right? Put him at third base and, 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 and you know, bring back Simmons, you know? Um, Simmons can basically play third and short anyway, so. <laughs> He's an Ozzy Smith-level <laughs> defender, so. Uh, the point being is, I think that there are, are ways that the Twins could go about reorganizing their roster. So guys like Luis Arias might have a chance long-term. I'm not sure they're creative enough to do something like that. Why not? Because big league clubs focus on results. They don't really look at what would change if you change situations. Although I will say that that kind of thinking is changing. I'll give you an example. Uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, they played Mookie Betts at second base the other day. Oh. Yeah. And I've been saying, Chris, I think I told you this, that you know Mookie Betts, when he was in the minor leagues, was like a gold glove level you second did. baseman. And in an era with the shift and with people like Mike Moustakis playing second base, why not try him at second? And now the Dodgers are doing it, especially with Trey Turner now in the fold. You got to remember that Trey Turner, early career, was center field. They moved him to shortstop from there because of his speed. He's a fantastic center fielder. You can keep Chris Taylor in a super utility role. Pollock can play every day. Muncie can play every day at first. You got Bellinger in the other corner. I mean, I don't know. I think that the Dodgers probably, after the trade deadline and after stepping back and assessing things, probably mm -hmm. have the best – I want to say probably. They have the best chance of winning the World Series this year. And if you're a Dodgers fan, be really excited here because that really means, the Dodgers. Yeah, that means that the Dodgers are the first club since the 1998-1999-2000 New York Yankees to have back-to-back -back titles. So dynasty. So, uh, and, and here, look, I can't promise anything. There's a couple of teams that could give them a run for their money, but. With what they have, I mean, they're clearly, clearly a cut ahead. Doesn't mean that, you know, they're impervious. Things happen. Injuries happen. Um, but I, I, I do think that uh, them versus the next team is a pretty big gap. And the Dodgers already had a roster that was basically talent-wise on par with almost any other team in baseball, if not every other team in baseball. And then they added Scherzer and Trey Turner for minor leaguers. So, um, yeah, those guys are massive difference makers. Scherzer's probably a top four pitcher in Major League Baseball. 
Trey Turner is a top three major league leadoff hitter. Uh, they already have Betts, who's right up there with him. I mean, you probably put Betts in the two spot, but point is, is the Dodgers have the most dynamic top of the lineup that I've seen probably in the last 10 years. It's fun to see a team that has, you know, a three, four hitter where they both hit like 45 bombs or whatever. Ooh, that's cool. But a lot of the time homers on mistake pitches. But if you have a one, two hitter where both of them are going to bat above 300, both of them are like 35, 45 steel guys. Mm -hmm. Both of them have the ability to hit 25 bombs. Like they're always, they're always getting on base. Like that's just so dynamic. And look, even if we're talking outside of base running in terms of stolen bases, if you want to get analytical here with me and just look at BSR, you know, Trey Turner could be putting up an 8.5 BSR and Mookie Betts could be putting up an 8.5 BSR, meaning between the two of them, you'd get 17 BSR at the top of your lineup over a full year if you know they had them both for a full year. So uh, and, you know, they're going to. Scherzer's a free agent after the year, sure, but Trey Turner has one more year under contract next year. So they got a whole year of the, the both of them together. You know, the, I'll tell you, uh, Chris Taylor, he took a big step forward for them this year. The Dodgers are really dangerous, really, really dangerous. There's a couple of other teams that are somewhere in the stratosphere of the Dodgers, at least in terms of um, – looking towards next season right but there's not very many that have a chance uh, of, of of catching up to the dodgers from outside of that group um i'd say like the edge teams would maybe be like uh the blue jays and the boston red sox those are two teams that um depending on what they do this off season um they can jump onto that tier. Uh, I think, you know, the, if the Yankees move on from, from Boone and um, they bring back Rizzo and bring back Britain, uh, possibly find a way to move Stanton, coupling him with some other talents who are perhaps not getting paid as much, um, you know, long-term talents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that the Yankees could start getting onto that level. Uh, Yankees would also have to add pitching. That's very clear. I think the Mets, with their roster, if they go about the right things this offseason, bring back Baez. That's a huge one. But, um, you know, just get creative with your roster. Like maybe since the Dodgers have Chris Taylor in the super utility role, use McNeil in the super utility role and then go and get like uh, Josh Donaldson, you know, so you're even more, uh, you know, dangerous. Um, you know, as, as much as I, you know, I think that James McCann has kind of re-earned um, his contract, like what he's doing now and, and will, and if you're looking at his profile month by month, looks like he'll continue to kind of do over the, the rest of the year, makes, you know, James McCann's contract look only like a slight overpay. <laughs> um, and, you know, you could probably put him in a deal you know, with a couple of prospects for the right players if you're the Mets. Uh, if I'm the Mets, I'm going to go for somebody who's really dynamic and dangerous at catcher. Um, and they have pitching locked down and bring back Stroman, bring back, you know, keep that rotation, you know. Um, and they have a good bullpen. I think it's worth doing the McCann trade with some prospects to make it an elite bullpen, which wouldn't take that many pieces. Uh, I think they have a fantastic bench. I think if they really want to get on the level of the Dodgers, they got to not just bring back Baez. Go get someone like Donaldson. Go get a really dangerous catcher. I think the using Nimmo in center as the platoon, you can do that one more year. You can get away with that one more year. And then reassess after, you know, after 2022 what you want to do in center field. Um, then of course, you know, DH is coming to the national league. So you got to remember that, you know, even a guy like Jonathan VR, you're going to be able to rotate him into at bats, which is very important. He, he offers a dynamic that diversifies the Mets lineup in a way that I think is really needed. Lindor and Baez do the same thing. 
Uh, they need that speed in there. They need that uh, aggressiveness in there um, because they have plenty of patience, power, and walks. I mean, patience really goes with walks, but I mean, it's just... <laughs> point is, is that they're a team that walks a lot and already has that profile. You know, the guys who are mistake hitters inside, outside the zone. Um, so I think the Mets could get up there. I think a healthy year from the White Sox plus a couple additions this offseason, which they have the money to do. Um, I think they could be right there. I mean, the Madrigal move was really interesting for me. They traded Nick Madrigal. I don't know if, if I if talked to you about this, Chris. They traded no, one of their top haven't. prospects away. But he had uh, an injury. He had a, a fairly significant injury um, to, I believe, his shoulder. And he already didn't have very much power. So this was something that was probably going to have to knock him down to the minor leagues to work on for maybe a year or so. He got traded to the Cubs, which was a brilliant move by the Cubs. The Cubs have needed guys who are going to be that type of difference maker. Uh, they've needed that, that type of – I mean, they had a great trade deadline. You got Kevin Alcantara from the Yankees. Um, they just – they had a phenomenal deadline. The only deal I have an issue with is probably the Chris, Chris Bryant deal. It's a little weird. But uh, overall, they had a phenomenal deadline. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, and that's the other, I do want to bring up one, one thing really quickly um, with regards to uh, Alcantara. Because, you know, while, while, we're, while we're here, mm -hmm. Alcantara is a very special player. I, I've watched him bat. He's like a six foot six guy, almost six seven, Aaron Judge type. So the, the, the Cubs got, they got more than what they needed. Um, but uh, I was talking about another guy that they got a second ago, not Alcantar, the other. Oh, yeah, Madrigal. Um, and this is a really important point with Madrigal. Recovering from the, his injury would take a couple of years, uh, maybe a year and a half. Given how Years. young, is. yeah, and, yo, we should we should do an episode on like, like injuries and stuff like that. Well, certain, like certain years, injuries. like yeah, certain, like certain injuries. Shoulder injuries are awful for athletes. If you're a pitcher and you get an ulnar collateral ligament injury, yeah, your shoulder, your velocity will never be the same. Um, if you are a hitter and you get that kind of injury in your shoulder your power goes away for 1.5 to 2.5 years. And if you already don't have power, you're probably going to go back down to the minors and have to work on a few things and slowly build back up and whatnot. It makes a lot more sense to do that on a club like the Cubs right now uh, than to do that on the White Sox. Um, so the Cubs got a good piece. The White Sox got one of the best closers in the game. They got Craig Kimbrell. So now the White Sox bullpen is the nastiest bullpen in Major League Baseball, in my opinion. Um, and they have Giolito, who I think is going to get a lot better next year. I think he's going to have to learn how to pitch without the sticky stuff. Uh, God, I love Donaldson. That's going to be controversial, but whatever. Uh, I'm a hitter, okay? I'm not a pitcher, although I'm learning how to be a pitcher. So maybe I should be with Giolito, but no, nah, no. Nah, I've never pitched with spider tack. And these people are complaining about, oh, I can't, you, I can't feel the ball. Garrett Cole said that. I was like, what are you talking about, dude? <laughs> but, uh, you know, Giolito, he'll get better next year. Um, Carlos Rodon is fantastic. Um, Lance Lynn is fantastic. Kopech will be ready for uh, a full season. Um, Crochet will be ready for a full season in the bullpen as well. I think Aaron Bummer will probably have a better season. Um, I think the reason why he's not doing as well uh, is firmly due to spider tack and um, the seams being lower. I think that really affected him, both of those things. Um, but, uh, yeah, if we're looking at the, 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 what the White Sox did, they put themselves in a position where if they can figure out a guy to play second base to replace Madrigal, which might – look, that might mean – that Yon Mankata has to move from third base back to second, which I think is probable, and he could be fine at it. He's a great player. He's a, one of the best athletes in Major League Baseball. Uh, and then they could go out and they could get a third baseman. 
maybe even go get a guy who can um, alternate, you know, a, a super utility guy, right? Um, but outside that, they're a very complete offense. Uh, you know, Luis Robert, Tim Anderson, Mankata, like I said, Jose Abreu, Andrew Vaughn, who's going to be a masher next year, even more so than this year. Uh, Grandol, while he's still good. Uh, Eloy Jimenez is back from injury. The point is, is that this is a roster that's stacked with young talent, with good talent, lefties and righties. So um, if they go get a second baseman or, or, or a third baseman, move Mankata over, um, all they really need, that bullpen being as good as it is, maybe another starter in there, you know, with all those other great guys. Um, they may not have to do that. It may just take, you know, moving Mikata to second and getting a third baseman, and they're right there. Um, so we got the Dodgers. That's the top dog. We got the Yankees. We talked about them. We got the White Sox. We got the Mets. The fifth team that I could say could get on that level, it all depends on what happens with Tatis's shoulder. Because Tatis has this shoulder thing going on right now. And what goes on with the Padres pitching staff because all of their guys have either been directly impacted after spider tack came out of the league or directly impacted at the beginning of the year when the balls were unjuiced, like all of all their whole pitching staff. And the only guys, okay. I won't say their whole pitch staff because Lamette, you know, but Lamette has constant injuries or, or, or and small injuries, but indicating injuries that he's going to eventually have to get Tommy John surgery. Um, so I think those are probably the teams. Well, one more, obviously. How could I forget about this? The Tampa Bay Rays. With, with, with the number one prospect in baseball up at the big leagues doing everything that people said that he would except for pulling the ball for power, uh, especially over the last, like, 12 games. Um, he's going to be a big component with what they're trying to do moving forward. Um, with, with Josh Lowe, he's almost big league ready. They could call him up at any moment. With Vidal Brujan, he's almost big league ready. They could call him up at any moment. With so many of these guys that are dynamic against righties, um, like, like uh, Brandon Lowe um, uh, and, and Austin Meadows, so many guys who are dynamic versus lefties. Now that they've brought in uh, Jordan Luplo and, and uh, Nelson Cruz, um, I think that I think that Tampa Bay also has been phenomenal at developing pitching. And they have a couple of guys who are fantastic in there. McClanahan is a lefty who throws over 100. Yes, that's right. A lefty who throws over 100. Uh, Patino is a righty who throws like 97, but it has so much life to it. He's fantastic. Um, and then next year, uh, Tyler Glass now is going to be back. So um, I don't know if they'll keep Cruz. They'll probably not keep Cruz. Um, but this is a team that is going to be dynamic from both sides of the plate. They're going to be great uh, at uh, base running. They're going to be great at defense. Um, they're going to have pitching. They're going to have bullpen. They're going to be managed the right way. Um, and that team as well could be right up there with the Dodgers. But after all of those teams, there's a significant gap because the only, the only teams that you get close to that grouping, like I said, are the Blue Jays who could get there if they spend, the Red Sox, who could get there if they spend. And I'll say the Brewers, if everything goes right for what they're trying to do moving forward. And, and like, that's it. Those are the only teams that I think could really make that leap this offseason because so much has gone wrong with the Braves pitching staff. And the Phillies don't nearly have enough in their pitching staff to make up for it in one offseason. You know, we could go, the Astros are falling off more and more after this cheating, as their players are trying to adapt, struggling, breathing for air, choking, and dying. Um, <laughs> I love how we, I love how, <laughs> I love how, I love how we start off with. Our circle. Let's get the, let's get the, I know, we're getting, you're, you're, this seems to be the theme of the podcast. We seem to make full circles, uh, beginning and end, and not only podcasts, live streams too. I, I, I love it. I love it. It's perfect. We always come full circle. Yeah, and I'll tell you, you know, that basically, you know, kind of brings me round on, on most of my points. I, you know, I could talk more mm -hmm. about, you know, 
the other teams that are like on the very edge, but like there really aren't any. The Giants aren't legitimate. The Cardinals are short term. It's a bunch of old dudes. Uh, the Cubs just sold everyone. The Reds are Frankenstein. We've talked about this in previous episodes. You got all sorts of weird people playing mm-hmm. where they should keep playing. You got two DHs playing the outfield. There, there's, there's, there's not much more to discuss here. Those are the, those are the best teams out there. But um, I feel like we should definitely do uh, like almost a second part to this episode mm-hmm. because I, I've talked about some of the things that I'm looking into with regards to these types of hitters. I want to readdress this when I have all of the hitters who are fantastic players. But when you step back, I want to have a list for you guys beyond just Pete Alonso, because I'm pretty sure like Jesus Aguilar off the top of my head, no versatility, can only play one position, can't play it well. He's not a very good base runner. He's a right-handed hitter. You know, he doesn't have tons of power. He has just enough. Impatient-ish bad, at least these days, um, or, or at least typically. Um, there you go. That's another guy. So mm-hmm. I'll have a list. We could do a part two to this. So I'm down I would, for I would that. love that. I'm down. You know, I'm always down. More content. Content is king. You know, I'm here for it. That's all it the time. Me, Chris. That's all I got. I mean, I'm just, I'm sorry. I'm already, I'm already on like the next episode. I'm like, we got to talk about these injuries. I'd love to do an episode on injuries and, just how long people are out, how could it, it ruin their career, things oh, like man. that Different and everything. Love, love. I would love to do an episode on let's that. Let's do it. Let's go. Yeah, let's go. Let's go. But that's really, <laughs> yeah, no, that's really that's really it here. Thank you for, for listening. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. The podcast is available on every major podcasting platform smash that like button smash that button smash that like button and leave a comment wherever you are review the podcast let us know we're let's amazing go. we let's know go. let's go let's go <laughs> <laughs> and uh i mean you'll be hearing from us next time see you then see you then